Let me start from the beginning. I, uh, it's very, very beginning, which is ancient Egypt, uh, to uh, present the idea that uh, all civilizational uh, cultures give their people a worldview, a sense of where they fit in the universe in every way. Now, what is interesting about this, and we talked about the chaos, um, is that this goddess, Mat, represents stability, order, coherence. Um, and if you see, she has a feather up there, and the feather is justice, morality. Um, the Ankh, which is life, and things that have to do with life. And the scepter, which is governance. And I think the symbolism is very clear here, where in order to have order in the universe and to govern, you have to uh, combine uh, these elements. If you don't have stability, you have chaos. And this is very prominent in Egyptian uh, thinking, in old Egyptian thinking. Chaos being evil, violence, injustice, everything that's the world doing today it would be considered chaos by ancient Egyptians. Uh, so uh, the, to get the stability, you have to have the uh, justice, morality, governance, harmony with nature, culture, gender, cosmos. I'm simplifying, but it's a work in progress, and I'm working on this in a, a more elaborate way. So as I said, ancient Egyptians would describe today's world as chaos, uh, not math. And it's disorder and no balance, no harmony between the spheres. Everybody hates everybody. Uh, and the ancient Egyptians really succeeded with its worldview to have one of the strongest states in history, and, and strongest and longest surviving of thousands of years. Very strong state. And you see the elements of it until today. That is, how to govern. And there are mistakes. I'm not going to, um, you know, say there are mistakes and so on. But it's a successful story, I think. Uh, if you look at uh, Native Americans, so, uh, some people, first Americans, the worldview also guides the people. It's to tell them that is your place in the universe. You have to be in harmony with it. Not that you are born now, exploit get these vegetables, get these, go to the bank, get this. There is a, a sense of harmony, and they are today suffering from the fact that they are, this view of the world is being disrupted. Um, as we know today, I mean, this is a, to this group is uh, redundant, but we have unilateral dominance, uh, defiance of the United Nations, challenge of sovereignty of nations, destabilizing regimes, uh, regime change, nation building. This is the, the picture in the world today, and that's what the people are seeing. They're seeing what's happening, what's this chaos? Challenge to trade agreements. I'm not naming any particular country, but <laughs> uh, trade and nuclear agreements, proxy wars, corporate capitalism that is very immoral. I consider it savage today. It's really savage. It's savaging environment and people. Trafficking exploded. It's very much interrelated to the terrorism thing, as Egypt has discovered. Trafficking is very interrelated. Trafficking of weapons, sex, human organs, drugs is all one. So there is word lawlessness, I think, that Matt the goddess will be very unhappy with us today. Um, human rights, which were intended to protect the rights of people, gets recognized to punish nation states that are not behaving. Uh, the monetary aid is also weaponized. If you don't subdue to the demands of unilateral dominance, then we're not going to give you the aid. So they go to Russia, they go to China, they go to Italy. Um, there is dissatisfaction among, uh, I would say, traditional elements of society everywhere, and that is both conservative and liberal. Everybody is upset. There is agitation. Uh, people are not robots. 
to just uh, exploit them for voting or let them do what we decide for projects. Uh, evolution, and that's you know the natural part, gave the human species a very unique capacity. It is very unique. The capacity to imagine, to conceptualize, not just to seek food and defense. And that is precisely where humans are different from even their closest relatives of 98% genes, the chimps. This capacity, what they do with this capacity is they think, they think of alternatives, they feel, they build, and so on. So humans communicate. There is a tendency to look at technology like it's a uh, running on its own. Technology made us do this. Technology made us do nothing. We made technology. Not only did we make technology, we made technology for a purpose. And we invented the tools so that we can do what humans are supposed to do by evolution, which is communicate. And um, it is the humans who, produ who produce the social media and there's a purpose, so we have to respect social media and we have to look more critically at social media. Um, that is critically both sides. There are bad things, like everybody thinks they are an expert, but there are good things. If you spend the time on something like Facebook and read the comments, these are opinions that I think the World Bank should really study. Um, so, they have, the ordinary folk are using the social media in an enabled way. And that is an important point. It's not just technology and we're using technology abstract sense. They are really beginning to express themselves. They feel that their role is strange. I can say my opinion. Oh, what are they doing? What's this asshole? And they use all kinds of language and boom, the real feel comes up. So it's an important kind of information that reflects how people who invented the social media in the first place, how they exploit it and use it. They engage directly in social networks. So you find a lot of work on uh, happy birthday or uh, I'm sorry your father died. But there's also uh, why are uh, the potatoes so expensive? We understand that the government is doing this and this. Why, are, why is it so expensive? That's on Facebook. But they also connect to professional circles and politics. And of course, we know that uh, politicians tweet policy today, that is heads of state tweet. Um, I will go over concrete cases very briefly, just showing you an image and making a point, and then I will wrap it up with a proposal of how we can connect all this together. Um, I, I wanted to start with Bosnian women protecting the river, but I will leave that to session 11. The caravan uh, migrants, uh, the Qatar dramatic urbanization from desert to high rise so fast. And how can you govern this way? Egyptians removing two presidents from the street. I talked about that in the sessions before. Um, this is the migrant caravan seasick weddle. Uh, there's a lot of uh, anger, and they want to exercise their rights, and they get communication from social media and so on of what is possible. They are suing the United States today and they are suing on unconstitutional grounds of what uh, immigration means and ha do they have the right of amnesty and so on. They are escaping violence, they are escaping not domestic violence, but gang violence, drug exploit, uh, um, drugs, um, and what the United States is doing to their country, which is making it impossible for them to realize their uh, potential economically, etc., and they feel, and Mexico has made uh, good proposals for them to stop there, we'll give you land, you sit and work, and they said, no, the status of needs, they have a purpose, and we are going to wait for what will happen then. Uh, the rapid, dramatic change in uh, Qatar. If you look at the, Qatar discovered oil and gas in, um, 
1940, they were beginning to even export a little bit. 1982, this is an interesting image. This is uh, some kind of a developer. I, I really didn't get the story of it. Built that uh, Salam um, shopping center in, in that. <laughs> they were beginning to, or, that's 82, right? In 2012, I was there for 10 years working there. And my office was here, and I was looking at it, Salam. And all of this is just like a little segment part of the day when I just took the camera and took that, it gives you a sense how rapid in three decades. Okay, but there's no infrastructure. Uh, the total population is about two million. Um, most of them are contracted workers. Uh, there are only about um, a very small population, maybe uh, 70 or 80,000 who are Qataris, and the Qataris themselves are made up of three kinds of populations. I'll go to that later. And um, uh, one, one part of it is the ruling Qataris who were Bedouins until recently. And until today, they spend their weekends going to some kind of a fake desert with their tents and so on just to live the, their days. Uh, but they are uh, roaming nomadic uh, uh, Bedouins, and others are, were pearl divers. These were the settled ones, but settled in that general area of the Gulf. And then they have this. They neither developed skills to deal with this. They're all outside workers. Uh, nor are they ready. They don't have a goddess, Mat, to tell them you know, how the world should go, where their place in the universe. So they are each one of the small percentage of Qataris owns about three or four luxury cars. They are very, very wealthy. Uh, I don't think that is an ideal model of governing because um, the governors are allowing the population to just indulge in wealth. So you can have 12 servants and you can have four cars and you can have this. And we will put you uh, nominally in a job, but we'll make this Egyptian and this Pakistani, this Indian, and do the real work. Is this really a mode of governance? I thought I'd bring that because I spent a lot of time not studying this in particular, but I was there uh, doing research and teaching uh, at the university. Uh, this, I have talked about it uh, before, uh, Egypt was considered to be in a state of chaos for about four decades uh, before the revolution. I'm talking about the 2011 revolution where people uh, rose and, and revolted. Uh, I don't think you can put a pin. These are public streets. Here is Alexandra. Here is Cairo by the famous Tahrir Square. Here they were just climbing on the tanks. They were angry at the armed forces. They were angry at the security forces and the police. They were angry at the leadership. And over here it says in Arabic on the tank that they took over from a group. They were really strong, but no violence. That they had no weapons. They were attacked, but they didn't attack. Um, no to Mubarak, the tyrant. Leave. Mubarak, leave. That's what they wrote. And the graffiti was all over the square. And um, obviously there was anger. Two years later, they felt that the revolution was hijacked from them by uh, Morsi, who was not even the, the ordinary candidate of the Muslim Brothers. We don't know where he came from. But anyway, um, here they went back to the streets. Again, this is Tahrir Square. And here they are saying, leave. Morsi, get out. The people. And it's not just going out for a day. They will not leave the streets, and they have not left the streets all over Egypt, all the provinces, until these leaders were out. I think this is a way whereby you mobilize. Now, the Egyptian revolution, this one, started with Facebook. A few youth 
started sending messages about my friend who went in security and they crushed his head and what's this and Mubarak, blah, 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 blah. And before you know it, it was mobilized. So if you're talking about how do people mobilize, the new media, these social media that were created by those humans in the first place because they have the capacity to think of how to communicate, they used it to change governments. Over here, of course, everybody was already on the media. By 2011, they were just in shock for two years, not knowing who Morsi is and why was he there. So most of the population didn't vote. And uh, the Muslim Brothers are a very organized institution in Egypt. And they were all bust and voted, of course. But they, he barely made it, but he made it. But the people were not happy. They were just in shock. So this is what I'm proposing to put together uh, from many of the experiments. Um, we have to integrate the global world and the nation state and include local people in equal way. Not that uh, we are worried about na uh, nations, uh, nation states, uh, in, in opposition to globalization. Okay, I think the, uh, particularly the Egyptian experiment here doesn't see any opposition. The world changed and globalization already took over. It is in the economy, it's in the politics. Uh, United Nations is part of a, a global uh, entity and institution. We're not going to go back to nation state the way some countries are talking about making um, such and such a country great. Uh, it's not a move inward. Um, instead of the balance of interests, uh, instead of the balance of power, they are more, uh, we move to the balance of interests with respect and transparency. There is a balance between national identity and globalization. We have to protect the integrity of nations, the sovereignty of states, because many of these institutions are built already on the basis of nation state, and nation state is the only medium that can deal in between the global and the people. Otherwise, you just leave out uh, people. Um, what Egypt did, and I'm using it as a model now because I'm watching very carefully what the new um, regime is doing. They are doing bilateral partnerships rather than coalitions. And they keep repeating that we're not doing coalitions, which has a, 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 a significance of um, war or attack or confrontation. We're doing partnerships. And as we speak, they have now a kind of uh, bilateral partner partnership for, uh, they call it a youth forum. But it's international, it's from the whole world. So youth participate from the whole world, they go to Egypt and they discuss. What do they discuss? What youth can do to run the world today? Where is their creativity? Where is their industry? And where are their objections? They listen to them for three days in Egypt, and then they go back to their country from all over the world. That's part of what I call bilateral partnerships. Um, they Im embedding human rights in culture and societal needs, not this abstract universal things of so-and-so has a right and so-and-so, and, -so and it, uh, using only the legal framework. Quality of life has to be inside the human rights, health, development, education, this is all human rights. If a country is trying to build education for its people, it's human rights. If it's building the development in a, a sustainable, or trying to, I'm not saying nobody reached perfection yet, and we are here around the table to do that, aren't we? And respecting the integrity of global institutions, such as the United Nations, this is something that Egypt now is making very clear. The United Nations is made up of nation states, we have to respect its integrity. We cannot just unilaterally go and take action and weaken an institution that we as human beings built together to mediate, to negotiate, to protect the people who are being killed and murdered, to help in wars. That's what's united. But it's unable to do that now because there are unilateral actions. Um, and on that side, between the, this is between the nation and the global, nation and the people. 
um, one model is to have the culture. When you have a very old culture, you cannot get away from the worldview that's in there. Mm -hmm. The people abide by it for thousands of years. <laughs> um, and when there is new technology come in, they subordinate technology. They subordinate technology to work with their worldview. Uh, so um, you can reaffirm your civilizational identity. Why? Remove it. If you have a civilization identity, some countries are new, like Qatar and so on, they don't have a civilization. They are trying to build an identity for things. And they are trying to use the elements uh, with help. What do we do to get the people to know that there is something called a nation state and we all belong? Or, uh, so this, uh, the uh, worldview would be culture, the vision would be the kind of vision we're all familiar with in Western style, which is put together uh, a policy and then see that the world changes. Um, you can do that by initiatives, by projects, but the key thing is to connect to the people and listen to them, whether it's through Facebook, Facebook or anything else, or have Facebook be a stimulus, and then you send uh, the governor or committee to talk to the people of that particular community and say, what, 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 what is it thing? Well, um, potatoes are very uh, expensive. I mean, it's, it shouldn't be that expensive given X and Y and Z, and they're inf informed about those because the, uh, the government is sending out information all the time. So, um, a, an initiative using local language so that every peasant and every person consuming those potatoes and tomatoes, they call it an initiative of our local vegetables in Arabic, I mm -hmm. translate. And that means they send some people or they, they uh, deal with people from the ground and tell them what's the issue. As a result, for instance today in Egypt, as a result of that initiative, the government introduced alternative markets because they want to still abide by the global competition, the capital competition and market. They are not going against it. It's not becoming socialist. I think this is important to know that it's not a polarity anymore. That there are options where you combine elements from socialism, elements from Communism, well, communism it has to have religion to be accepted, and elements from uh, capitalism. It's not either or, but we tend to think always that these are socialists, these are communists. So our local vegetables essentially uh, introduce alternative markets, lower prices. That's competition. So the people are going to these and they publicize them all over television and all over Facebook, telling them if you want uh, reasonable priced vegetables, and they are the same vegetables, but we don't have alternative farms or private. I mean, they are the same sources, but the government managed to either subsidize or to cut the profit margin that mediators uh, do. So they removed that part and it's available, so the people immediately responded. and. Then, uh, we are all alone. I don't remember really what is this. It's very interesting uh, in Arabic. We are, we are all one integration. They created a ministry called a Ministry of Solidarity, Social Solidarity. I think that's very clear. It's not an NGO. It's a ministry with the government. And uh, they put a woman there who's very, very competent, and she reaches out. Your voice is heard that comes from you know all these complaints yeah you told us we're doing this we're doing that we now we got gas we got oil where's the money that's on facebook solidarity and dignity these are real initiatives with real names in arabic a project would be like social housing and many many other projects and so on but that involves the people i don't mean that the nation serves the people the nation with its tools listens to the people and interacts and then makes the people work on groups and committees that would make that possible. Same with the global. You don't remove the global. We don't want to build a nation states that isolated and to kill the global idea because I think it's not even 
possible to do it today given how the economy is all interrelated and um, the uh, information technology is all interrelated, but you can uh, balance. And instead of just going coalitions, and the coalitions are just to get war and attack other people and so on, but you do interest. We are both interested in, we work with Italy because we want to get the gas uh, fields going. We work with, uh, and they work with uh, enemies. I mean, they work with people who are enemies to each other. It's not coalitions. Uh, and I think that this, um, I see as a very uh, promising model, but it's just open to discussion. Thank you.